<clears throat> Let's have a look at the photo first, okay? So imagine the grid, grid on the paper, grid on the photo, something like this. I, I'm always going to do this grid, folks, until a point where I think, you know, because it's, when we get people joining us, newcomers to the classes, um, of course, you know, I, I want them to be as familiar with the use of the grid. So it only takes a couple of seconds anyway. But there's the grid. <clears throat> you imagine it or you actually draw it in lightly on your paper. Um, so the focal point is the next thing. And the focal point is let's go for the bottom right that that's the obvious one to me anyway probably easier to see if i show you on the sketch so the focal point is this territory here okay that there given that the grid is something like this over here and again you know just a quick thing about the grid um once you've got once you've got these sort of nine squares it'll sort of give you an indication as to where these details go so that section there of the lower horizontal and the right hand vertical is, look at what falls almost on on top of it there it's that window so so that's a good starting point once you've got something in your design so we know the window is it's about there now, if that's too big or too small, I can make adjustments. But for the moment, that's what we'll do. We'll just place that window there, okay? Um, now, I'm, I'm referring to my um, sketch and my photo, which is in front of me here. And the church, the next thing I'm going to go for is that beautiful church spire that's approximately here somewhere. Um, and... It certainly doesn't, uh, there's a little block square design at the base of it there, okay? And that, if you look at the grid line, is, um, so, so what I'm saying is it would be easy if, you, if you're not watching, if you're not being careful, to bring this down, perhaps too far down to the grid line. It doesn't come anywhere near the grid line if you look at it. It comes about half, well, just over halfway down uh, this, this square up here in the top right. So this again is the benefit, the beauty of, of, of working with a grid. So I'd say that the roof came over here, something like that. There's a negative space of sky between in here. Okay, something like that, isn't there? So that's, I, I, you see, it's so much easier to, instead of thinking, well, how far does this building on the right come in from the, from the right-hand side? Um, don't, don't, don't Try this. Instead of thinking that, thinking how big is this and where is it, where is it positioned? Once you've got your um, spire in like this, think about the size of that negative shape. That'll give you a, probably a more accurate um, position for this right-hand building. Right-hand building comes down here. That's just a vertical. Comes down below the window, doesn't it, where it meets the pavement to almost directly on that um, horizontal line. And then we don't worry too much about how this ground line up against the wall disappears for the moment, but it does seem to appear to go out about there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we won't worry about what's going on on the facades, on the faces of this building for the moment. Um, we'll stick with the main uh, structure. There's a nice little bit of ornamentation here on the end of the roof, something like that. There's a little bit of detail that changes at the edge of the church there. I remember rightly, that might be a museum or a library or something now. Um, anyway, it comes down here, something like this. See how my window is going to have to uh, be moved now? Because my wall, I could bring this out a little bit further, but my wall, uh, we forget the cars, by the way. There are two cars here. Um, they're not, I, I don't, I, I'm going to replace them with figures. I'm going to put figures in here. 
So what we need to do now, because I feel as though that's about right, this, we've come in from the right hand side enough, we, we don't want to go any further. So it's a case of moving the window. This is what I mean about, you will have to make adjustments, because it could just be that, you know, the, the ratio of horizontal to vertical in the photo uh, format is slightly different to your own paper that you're using. So, um, of course, if you really wanted to be pedantic about these things, you would um, make sure all the ratio of everything was exactly the same, 16 to 9 or whatever it is, or 3 to 1 and 1.5, what, whatever it is. What's more important for us as fine artists and impressionists is to get the feel of it. So I'm just placing in a couple of sort of shapes in the window there. Um, and there's other details. Let's leave the details out again for the moment. Perhaps we sh what we should do, though, um, is put in. So again, that window there, I've probably gone a little bit too high. It's down here somewhere like that. It's quite a bit closer to this bottom window. So, you know, I'll, I'll break the rules, but at the same time, I don't I don't want to I don't want to make it to take it to a point where it's just not recognizable as this place. So as I say, the roof then comes across something like that. And then there's this triangular shape. See how the triangular shape, uh, the apex, the point of that triangle seems to sit more or less in the middle of this structure behind the spire behind. So all these things are ways of making sure that um, your, your drawing works. Okay, and there are these mini spires. Pro they've probably got their, their own name, something like this. Again, it's most of it's an approximation for, for this, this stage. And then there seems to be an angle there of sorts. So there's a, as though this is a facade and on its own, it's a block, and it does sort of protrude a bit in our direction. That should be enough for us to recognize this. Now, it doesn't matter. I, I don't concern myself with what goes on down at ground level back here, okay? Um, that's something we can deal with later when we start putting... Um, painted details in, suggesting that there are things at ground level. Um, if I look really close, can't be absolutely sure, but it looks like there might be people sat at a table just about here somewhere. So anyway, we don't know that. Anyway, let's, let's move on from that. And then these perspective lines, uh, look, look at Look at these perspective lines. There's a little bit of a lintel here on this building. Actually, it's a bit low. It's there, isn't it? There's a lintel there. And um, it seems to sort of want to... So, so next thing we should, sorry, consider before we move on to the rest of the buildings is this eye line. Before we continue, please consider subscribing to my channel and if you want immediate notifications as to when I upload a new video, then please remember to also click on the bell icon. And I'm looking at where I think the eye line would be. I, I'm guessing this, I, I have to. I'm guessing that if a person was stood up against this window back here, their head would just be above the bottom sill. So it's a whopping great window. Um, so that means the eye lines, are, for the moment at least, again, we can, we can change this slightly, but we need to know, need a, a fair idea as to where, where it is now. I'm suggesting that the eye line is about here, the bottom of this window. Uh, so if, uh, you know, just to sort of, re to establish that, let's for the moment pencil in another figure about here somewhere in the middle of the road. Okay, so we're leaving the cars out for the moment. There is, uh, yeah, so that, that's, sorry, that, that line there, this is a bit of a guess at the moment. If you followed that converging line onto the, onto the eye line, it seems as though our 
vanishing point for this right hand building is about here somewhere it's about there so let's get rid of that because it will make us it'll be it'll look rather strange if we leave that in um so if of course we did if if we could see another lintel on this same building okay this is not a lintel on this building by the way folks if you look close it's another sort of um it's another sort of apex end of this this building here. Um, but if we did have another, let's get rid of that one because it doesn't exist really. Um, but if we did have another uh, lintel here, ledge, it'd be slightly more acute, okay? Because it would still want to land on that same on that same vanishing point there. I think I had a little bit of um, blue paint on my eraser. I'm not worried about it right now, but uh, to just give you an idea as to what's happening here, okay? As, as these uh, lines come down, of course, they get shallower and shallower until you'd eventually end up on the, um, the, the perfect horizontal, which of course is the um, eye line and the headline, okay? If we want the, um, the perspective line at the bottom of the building, and these are, of course, thumbnail rules. Um, you know, you, you're not going to go far wrong if you decided to take, go from the vanishing point and establish the baseline of this building from that point there. But in, sometimes in the real world, particularly in these older buildings and older towns, um, things have moved over the years. So um, just be a little bit careful with that. The ones that you've got to be most careful are of are the ones that are actually on the building itself. But, uh, you know, these things are, excuse the pun, not set in concrete. Um, so just, just bear that in mind. It, just stick to the rules um, and break them when you, when you have to, when you feel you have to, if they're not looking right or, or whatever. Anyway, uh, so let's move across now. Look at the really small measurement of the furthest buildings as they disappear down the road. They're barely, the, um, they're barely at the same height as, as the window. So the top of those roofs back there in those houses are below that windowsill height there on the nearer building. And, and, and this is what I mean about once you've established one shape and, and, and the scale of something, and you know you're fairly confident that you've got the scale right here in one place, then everything else, it, it, that is the benchmark, sorry, for everything else. You can measure everything else from this. So let's say that the building down there, can't see the actual base of the furthest buildings, but I'm gonna guess, because they're obscured by cars, but I'm gonna guess it's about down here somewhere, actually on, it looks as though it's on the um, horizon line from here. So those buildings come out, I'm just gonna do this very quickly for a moment. The width of that smaller, uh, area, the, the, the area of smaller buildings, is just past center, I feel, about here. So for now, that's what we'll do, but worry about the shapes and the chimneys. I'm going to play this all down anyway with sort of grays and, uh, and weak paint. But just before we get to the vertical left-hand grid, you can see how there's a jump in height at the corner of that building. And it goes up something like this. There's a, there's a chimney about here somewhere, a little chimney. Uh, and then there's a, another little gable end, an apex or whatever you, you, you'd call this. And then we're actually up quite a bit higher, but I'm, I, I'll use what I've got here, I think for the moment, stay, stay with this. And then about here, there's a chimney, slight angle there and um, we you can see what's going to happen we're, we're not going to do we probably won't fit in what's left most what's uh, uh, furthest left because our um our format is is running short of that there's another chimney here i'll show you which building i'm on right now okay i'm on this building here that one there with the two big chimneys so it looks like we're, we're not going to get that building in just there. Okay, so 
there's a lovely shape here, which I pick up on straight away because that that would be good for light, that for conveying light. It might be a shadowed side, but it might be a, an illuminated side. We'll decide on that. Again, the the sun went in, came out. It went back in. Um, but the main gist, you can just about see here that the light was almost above us, but slightly to the right, I think. So, so as light was coming down a little bit like this. So, so I'm not too worried about what goes on here. Something like that. That roof meets that roof. Let's show a couple of soft pencil lines for the um, ends of buildings that, that, that delineate the bottoms of buildings. Now, the bottom line of these buildings doesn't go much below the eye line, the horizon line. OK, it's very shallow there, right from from about here to there. They so don't come all the way down here like this. It will look completely wrong. If your buildings start, uh, if you're suggesting that your buildings are meeting the ground down here where my finger is, it's it is a very shallow uh, uh, up, upward going line. So it's a very shallow line going from left to right, upwards ever so slightly towards the um, the horizon line. Now. I've often been in this situation before. I think, yeah, that that's it. I've got it. I've got it. That's I'm I'm I think I'm right there. And then something in your drawing when you check it over, you think, nah, there's something not right there. But so so be mindful that you know all these things are rules. Um, but perspective is a very it's 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 not a true <laughs> it's not always a proper science, a true science. It, it's it, 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 there are things you have to do to make your painting work, but but you must start somewhere and you must start with those rules that we've just been looking at. So, you know, eye line, establish the eye line um, and work to a vanishing point somewhere. If I don't get rid of a lot of those lines, then when we come to painting it, we'll be um, it'll really throw you out. So. When you're done with your drawing, folks, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes here to, to do this. When you're done with your drawing, check it, push it away from you, stand back. Um, even if you can't stand back, if you haven't got the space where you're working to stand back and look at your drawing from a distance, I'd say at least for better still about five or six feet away, um, depending on, you know, I'm working on 15 by 11 here. Um, I need to be really about five to six feet away to check that drawing. Um, if you can't, don't have that um, space, then take it off whatever it is you've got it on your board, um, uh, take your board rather, and put it on the floor because the distance between you stood up and the floor is a good distance for, um, for viewing this and checking your lines and your measurements. And just to see if, you know, perhaps this building over here looks slightly awkward. Perhaps it's leaning, you know, perhaps all your lines are leaning from uh, from right to left or the other way, you know, they're leaning from left to right. Because I'll, I'll, I'll warn you this, it's something that took me years to realize, but, um, and uh, I could do it and prove it easily now. When I look for, when I freehand a vertical line in, I don't sometimes go left to right. I don't sometimes go right to left. I always go um, left to right. And I have to really, I, I, I never, I, I never do it the other way. I never make it uh, so that it goes the other way. Whenever I try a vertical line, there's always uh, a left to right angle on it like this. And I've learned that just from, just by doing it a lot. Um, we do things, it's, it's our muscle activity. It's, a, it, it's, it's what we do. Um, yours might be the other way around. Um, you might be really lucky and be able to do it, do, do pretty, pretty nigh on perfect vertical lines. And whenever I'm doing a vertical line, I'm conscious of what I do. And you need to learn that about yourself. Um, 
So I have to compensate often. And even then I find myself uh, fixing it quite a lot. So that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. I'm making sure that I haven't fallen into the Howard Jones uh, vertical problem. And, uh, and, then, um, and then the horizontals do place a couple of figures in, preferably uh, people standing. Uh, people sat down at tables don't really um, answer your question. You need to sort of say, well, you know, if there was another person over here, if there was a person much closer to us, their heads, of course, are still going to be on this line. It's, it's always a tiny amount higher if they're much closer. Uh, let's, if the person walking away from us, okay? Again, we're dealing with mostly flat ground here, though there is a very slight gradient of the, of the road going up away from us, but very little. But again, if you were to put a figure in here, which we will be doing, by the way, we will be putting figures in this area, um, then again, the head has to go on that line or only the closer they get to us, slightly above it. Um, and the further away down the road they get, they go slightly lower than the line. But that's why we always say they're all on the same, head. you know, rule of thumb, all heads on the same, same line, horizontal line. So we'd have this figure about here, something like that. So just a quick reminder on figures then, folks, on, whoops, it's me kicking the um, camera stand here. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, so if the heads are always on the same line on flat ground, it can, the only thing to make them look further away is their scale. So the heads have got to stay there. It's where the, it's the length and the height of the body. You see how the feet meet the ground of this furthest figure up here, about halfway through down at hip level of the nearer figure, okay? But it's always the, um, as you go further away, it's always the feet that go further and further up. And the scale, of course, of that is it diminishes too. the the, the overall scale of that figure. Um, OK, I'm going to put in another figure here. Maybe uh, be nice to have a figure. about here somewhere, we'll have them a little bit more an animated with their arms out. Maybe they're carrying something. Um, oh, it's almost always put uh, one and a half legs in my figures. That shows a bit of movement. What about the rest of it then? Um, I like quite often just to do some ground lines to show us the direction of the road. And I would, for the moment, guess that this pavement here comes across something like this, something like that. Now yours might be different slightly. You on your own drawings, you see, you only have to make a, a slight change of measurement somewhere, and that line that I've just put for my uh, curb edge will uh, will be different to yours. So this is the reason why we we stop, walk away, look at the sketch, look at the design, look at the um, the, the layout, and ask yourself, does it look right? You know, does it does it look correct? Um, so that's exactly what I'm doing, and hopefully this is a good opportunity, folks, for you to take a little bit of a breather. I think my line is about right. So we don't really, for the moment at least, concern ourselves with the with the with the shop window area of this of this road. Okay, it's um, it's something that you will find much easier to establish when the rest of this stuff has gone in. Um, let me just so that I'm just erasing some of these unwanted pencil marks where I've been explaining things. So I have a just take a, a minute on that, folks. I'll probably go straight through on this demonstration, and we'll have a we'll have a chat at the very end. Um, because with um, as with all um, townscapes. When we're dealing with buildings, the drawing does need to be correct. So it just cuts down our, our um, it, it cuts out a break time really, other than the end when we're all done. So but do check your drawing. And I'm looking at things now like the perspective lines of this building here. 
that would that's got to go down hasn't it now these buildings off the left the left side of the road here they they do not share the same vanishing point as the buildings from the right hand side remember we decided the vanishing point of this building here went out about there i think it was somewhere if you follow that line but if you follow the main line that one's wrong that see that that's why this is so important to check just realize that my neighboring little house there those lines were wrong because that shares the same vanishing point way out of sight goes disappears behind the, this building on the right the vanishing point for these left-hand houses is just out of shot it's just actually off our paper over there somewhere um, and remember, the head height and the horizontal is down here, isn't it? That's the eye line. So none of these lines can be flat horizontal. They must be, this is shallower. It will end up on the same vanishing point as that one over here somewhere. But as we get closer and closer to ground level, we get closer and closer to um, the, hor the, the eye line, the horizon line. And when you land on that, of course, everything along there should be, should be horizontal. So maybe the base of the building, as I say, is a slight, very shallow upward um, uh, converging line, something like that. So I've gone, I've got more nasty, heavy pencil work over here. We'll get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of some of that. It's quite nice to have these sort of lines at ground level. They show off the overhang, the canopies or whatever, the uh, of, of the shop windows and shop fronts. So I think folks, I, again, I'm gonna leave you just ponder on your drawings for a moment, checking, checking all your lines. Just cleaning up my drawing a bit. And I think we'll get some paints going in about two minutes. So, yeah. So what I like about the next bit is that we sort of continue, the way I work anyway, and, and, and I know you're all mostly familiar with the way I work, you should be by now anyway. Um, I, I, unlike a lot of watercolorists, I continue the sort of drawing going only with a small paintbrush and a bit of weak paint. And I really enjoy working this way because it just allows you to keep, keep focused uh, on the design and not go astray. If you suddenly start putting out large, strong paint mixes on top of the drawing, it, it, you can't go back from that. You know, there's, there's, there's um, a certain sense of, you know, once the paint's on there, it's on there. But by doing what we do and what I do, um, we, we keep everything uh, in control. We keep in, in, sorry, in control of everything. So looking at my drawings one last time before I pick up the paint, uh, I haven't done much about these buildings on the left-hand side, but we know that they have windows there. The odd little pencil mark as I'm doing now can work. There's some sort of uh, dormer type windows on this roof. We might hint upon those if we can. Uh, it would be good if we could just, just, but they, they, they don't, you know, don't, uh, don't panic about things like that. They're, they're no more than just a tiny little uh, glimmer of white paper half the time with a dark mark on the shadow side of them and then the brain says ah it's a, it's a dormer window i get that um, a couple of windows here on this building and we've left out this building here so we'll just play that down with a with a mix of paint over here the one area I think often uh, might catch us out is what we do right at the edges of our uh, 
our paintings right over here, right on the right hand edge. Not so bad over here because it's quite busy anyway. Um, but this building is in shadow on the right, but there are windows there. So we probably just have to, we'll probably what we'll do is um, we'll put some mix of warmish colors and gray, gray, warm grays over here. And maybe what we can do when that's still wet or damp, we can lift out a bit of paint to suggest there's a, a window reflecting some light there. But these sides are much like the foreground. You can't overdo them. You must keep um, those areas um, fairly simple. Okay. Right. Let's pick up some paint. So I've got the little round pointy brush. Okay. Good point on it. Synthetic. Um, and I'm going to start suggesting uh, some windows, some line work, some edges. And I'm going to mix, pick up a little bit of uh, um, cerulean blue here. Sorry, let me just make sure I actually put. No, no. Let Let's use cobalt blue. Sorry, I've put cobalt blue on the list, and that's what we're going to use. So it doesn't really matter. You know, I, I say this all the time, folks. We we um, we stress out about what what's the right color. It's, trust me, within reason, there's only a few exceptions where the color, the actual color is, is important. This is just a blue um, and I've put cobalt on this. So I'll use cobalt, but I'd be just as happy using cerulean blue. And into that, I'll put, uh, again, it doesn't matter really whether this is for most part, uh, raw sienna or burnt sienna. I might plumb for burnt sienna in the slightly darker windows, but raw sienna in the furthest windows because the raw sienna is going to make the mix a little lighter in color. So let's put a little bit of raw sienna for now, and I can go darker in these if I so choose. This is quite watery, this, but think what I want you to think is that it's as though you're drawing again, okay? There's a, a notch here, a little sort of lozenge shape here. The less perfect you do these, the better. But the only thing I, I sort of say is do try to make sure that you're, every time you put a, a shape down, as we're doing now, make sure you get things right, like the vertical. Don't, don't suddenly put a window pane in this window that would be in the wall or off, off center from the window that's above it. Unless in real life, of course, they are offset. Um, so just check your alignment. Uh, where else can we? go, um, I can come down the side here, a little touch to the to the edge of the brush, then a line, uh, same over this side to sort of suggest, tell your viewer, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a this, a, this is facing us with lines either side, a shape that protrudes, a promontory. Um, as I say, if I want to go slightly darker anywhere, I'll simply pick up the burnt sienna instead of the raw sienna, but I feel as though they, they could be a little bit heavy. Now, the other thing, of course, is I want to dry this paint out, so it can't all be a wet uh, mark. This, if I take a tissue, will give me a much drier delivery. Actually, it's still a bit wet there, isn't it? So that'll give me a much uh, drier delivery. And then We'll chase this triangular shape up here. There's a shape there in the middle. There are these little turret things here. And I'm just going to pick up a little bit of the Payne's Gray or neutral tint, whichever you've got in yours, and make a slightly different, slightly darker mix like this. I'll warm it up. Burnt sienna, neutral tint. Well, I want this to be dry brush. So I take most of that paint off on a piece of tissue and watch how much drier this, this application is. Actually, it would be if I took a bit more off. Um, and it, it just doesn't, um, it, it, it's a much more brittle edge. Wants a bit more warmth in it.
get that color right. I'm going to use a bit of um, ultramarine blue here. It gives me a good dark. But this offers such a fantastic texture for buildings. And there'd be a lintel under here, like this. Roof line up here we could put in. There's a line there. There's this um, sort of shuttered type sort of uh, effect on this. On this uh, steeple up here. Something like that. Just keeping an eye on my, I'm referring to the photograph all the time for this, you know, because this is the stage where I do use the photograph for my uh, information and, and, and ideas as well. But there will come a point, and I, I'll try and um, highlight it when we get there, as to when I give up on the photograph. And this is the way all my paintings go. You, um, you use the photograph, for only a certain amount of the job of the of the of the design, but you must um, you must depart from the photograph at some point in every every painting. Otherwise, it, it, that's where it will all go horribly wrong for you. Um, you're never going to get a, a photocopy. This is paint on paper, you know. Um, you, so you. You've got to try and re recognize that moment when it's time to uh, um, depart from the photo. I usually find it's it's the, it's when um, it's it's when the bigger washes start uh, needing to be uh, applied. Now there's a flag post with Union Jack on it here. Just put that in. I, I bet you I lose that. It probably will disappear. Now, Sometimes I've even forgotten to put the flag in, but if I put a line there, it looks a little bit awkward. It should jog my memory to say, well, what's that strange line going in a completely different direction to everything else? And then my poor little brain will say, ah, yes, of course. It's the, um, it's the flagpole thing there. So I'm only guessing what this is. It's just a... It's just a few vertical marks like this, because we know that's what we'd expect to find there. Sort of doorways and windows. But I'm flitting all the time between, and mostly now, I've got to be honest, mostly uh, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna at the moment. But when I want to go pale again, I'll go back to the cobalt blue and raw sienna. But this near foreground uh, uh, stuff that I'm doing is uh, a lot of it is the is the darker and warmer mix of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Something around ground line here. We we can't see what it is, but the odd mark that will go up to the wall like this will help us convey a suggestion of uh, the lie of the land there. And even a, sometimes like a, a, a line across the pavement here like that will tell the viewer, the, the brain, that there's, there's a flat there, there's a horizontal. It's always, isn't it? It's always about inference rather than statement. It's just a suggestion. You're never more, you're never doing anything more than suggesting things. Okay. If I've got to come back over here, I shall. I, I probably will, because I think some of those windows in this focal point territory will need to be darker. Just one or two of them, not all of them. Um, so let's move across the road here. And the first thing I do is go back to a much more watery mix, OK, and choose the slightly lighter cobalt blue and the raw sienna. If you think about it, it's just, a, it's just a version of this mix, only lighter, 
made lighter by the amount of water, apart from the fact that the two colors are lighter in tonal value themselves. Okay, that should do us. There'll probably be a little less dry brush over here, but not, there will be some, but there will be less dry brush. So let's, um, let's have the tissue ready. So if I make a mark, something like this across that building, I can take it out because as soon as I take it out, that's about the right strength, okay? So we said there are these little sort of dormers up here. We'll put a little hit behind each one because the lights come in that way. They'd be, they would just be little uh, dark spots um, with the reflected windows on the right-hand side of each one of them like that. Uh, across the foreground here, there are, windows and, and uh, overhangs. Under the overhangs, of course, there are darks and lights. That, that's what, that's a good way of conveying, you know, uh, shop fronts, darks and lights, often little vertical hits like this. Um, another window there. Um, more water in the brush, I think. Uh, we'll just do some, we think there's a slight darkness to those rooftops just there, there's that little chimney. I'm looking up, looking down, looking up, looking down, just just keep looking back and forth my, my reference. Look up, look down, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> Uh, look up, look down. There's a slightly warmer looking um, dark here. A bit more burnt sienna here, just there. Sorry, a little bit of burnt sienna instead of raw sienna. And then that dark and warmth seems to creep into the next building a bit. But when I, when I get down to about here, just going to pick up some raw sienna for the moment. Same small brush, just pick up some raw sienna. Find somewhere on my palette which is mostly clean. It doesn't have to be absolutely clean color. That there. Be quick, just do the whole thing. Go over the heads even as well as the figures if you've got yours in. And if we creep this way, okay. Creep this way. That 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 color can still creep in over these. Because if you've got this, um, these weak window marks that you've made uh, uh, right in terms of water and paint, they should be almost dry enough to paint over as I'm doing now. And if they do move a little bit, then all well and good. So some nice bit of warmth here on the end of the buildings. Before that goes dry, I'll come back to it in a moment, but it's just a tad too wet right now. But I can't wait, mu wait much longer to do something about that. Bit of color in the roof here for the moment, like this. Bit more warmth in the lower area, like this. So let's um, come back to this. I think it's about right now. There's a quite a, you know, small window of opportunity here. I'm going to pick up. Um, what shall we? Take up a tiny bit of alizarin crimson and go into this dark mix that we had going for the windows and things. Tiny bit of alizarin crimson into that gray. And so what that'll do is allow us to do the tops. That's a bit strong now. So I've put my brush in water and I've taken all everything out. And I'll just use the paint that I've already just delivered but stopped delivering. And there's a couple of chimneys down there, isn't it, on those buildings. Just do the tops like this. That's probably going to suffice. Don't, don't I'm, I'm fiddling, you know, and I, I'm always telling people not to fiddle. Uh, so coming back again, there are roofs. There's not a roof there. I don't know what that was. Um, there are roofs. It's not exactly the same as the. Um, 
as the uh, photo, as long as it's close, um, it'll still look like the place that you're aiming to convey. See how I sort of spot a little sort of dark end to a building down there. So I come down to ground level with that dark. Um, and then again, it's mostly a darkish line along here at ground level with a couple of gaps. And again, we'll always, we can always come back to those anyway. I'm just doing this. I, I, this is not necessarily something that's in the photo. Um, I, I'm sort of saying, I'm suggesting here that um, there's a bit of red, bit of warmth here, because if you don't introduce colors in the photo, there's a bit of red on the on this building, but we can't see that building. So I'm pushing this little bit of red into my painting at this point here because it needs it. You know, it, it does actually need that color variation. Maybe the roof is along that line of color too. Keep it weak, don't go strong. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be anything too strong in this painting so far. Uh, tonal, you know, in terms of uh, color saturation, that, that's in color intensity, if you like, or tonal value. Most of it should be mid ground. Okay. Suppose we put better put something on this roof here where my paintbrush is. Again, a um, bit of cobalt blue, bit of burnt sienna, bit of alizarin crimson. I'm really deliberately creating uh, greys. There's nothing saturated. There's nothing clean about these colours. But if you had to describe them, you'd probably say there seems to be a little bit of a purple tinge to it on the blue and the red. Okay, let's soften all this edge out. There's some trees behind here, but I think we ought to perhaps put those in at the end of the painting. Because um, in a moment too, I, I want us to sort of think about the sky. Because so I'm going to do the sky. It may, may be a bit of an odd way of working this, um, but um, I'm going to do the sky before the right-hand building. And I'll tell you why. Why, why did I do this before the sky? Um, there's a lot of weak paint over here, and I, I knew that by going into this first, I could put the sky in. I, I'd have some, I'd get my edges. It's much easier to get your edges on dry paper. If you think about, if we were to put a, 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 a wash on here, it's a bright day. If we put a wash in the sky first, I'd have had a devil of a job defining the edge, unless I'd waited. And I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't do the waiting game terribly well. I, I like to start the painting and have as little stops and pauses as possible. Because one thing you've got to try to avoid is the upsetting of your momentum. When the brain's in the right place, try to stay there. Don't let anything uh, interrupt that. So, so if I'd have gone in with the sky, I'd have waited. I could have, I could have you could speed dry it, couldn't you, with a hairdryer? Um, but the point I'm making is I wanted a cleanish edge to the even to the distant buildings because it's a bright sort of day. It's not a gloomy, misty day or a very hot day even where you get those softened edges in the distance. So, um, yeah. So, and, and, you know, you might choose to work the other way yourselves. You might think, well, I'll, I'll put the wash in and I'll, I'll have the patience. I'll, I'll wait for the sky to dry out or I'll speed dry it with a, with a hairdryer. Um, it, that's your core, folks, honestly. Um, right, okay. So as I say, I'm gonna think about a wash now that comes from the sky into the buildings to a certain degree and across the road, okay? Now, one question, and I'm asking myself this, um, is the photo gives us a very grey, again, if you have to describe that colour of the road, the, the tarmac and the pavement, virtually the same colour. The tones vary. Seems that the shadowy side of the path over here is darker than the, the illuminated road. But what colour are we dealing with? You can't just sort of call it grey. That's a bit of a cop-out. Um, 
it is a gray strictly speaking but you need to make up your mind as to whether it's a cool gray or a warm gray now the sky will have some say in this the sky is blue it's cool the, the hard surfaces will reflect definitely reflect the color that's in the sky so we've got to get even if we decide to give it a warm looking road like a wash of war, uh, raw sienna um it's got to have some blue in it because it will reflect the sky so there's my um so to clarify that as an answer i'm gonna once i've got the blue of the sky in um i'm gonna bring that blue down into the into the road okay probably into all of the road and then i'll decide uh while it's still wet or damp then i'll decide where how how much i want to warm that cool blue down with something like raw sienna maybe even burnt sienna so and even maybe a little bit of alizarin crimson because that gray as i say to me it's a it's it's certainly you know it, it, the bench the um, rules say well let's make the gray cool let's make sure there's plenty of blue in the gray down there down the end of the road but as we get closer to ourselves that that gray warms up so it'll go from a blue gray to a neutral perhaps or a warm gray uh to get and warmer still okay um but here's a funny thing i don't want to throw too much at you once but <laughs> um you, you don't really want to want to go once you get into a little bit of warmth about here. OK, you don't want to get warmer and warmer because that, that's what logic says. If it's cool down there, then surely the warmest area has got to be down here, right under your feet. Um, for some aesthetic reason, I don't have a better answer than this. For some aesthetic reason, your warmest area needs to be about here. OK. I have my own theory why that is, and it's something I use a lot, whether it's I'm painting fields, the foreground of fields, um, whatever. Uh, my theory is that um, the eye is attracted to warmth, okay, probably more than it is to cooler colors. So if you put the warmth, if you put a strong warmth right under the viewer's nose here, there's a sense of them wanting to stay there, okay, and not wanting to explore beyond. A bit like dangling the carrot just slightly out of reach you pull your viewer in because they want to move into the slightly warmer area here okay um but if you study you know reputable artworks some of the classics there's evidence of this um particularly in landscapes and and, and city scenes and stuff like this there always seems to be a warmth just above the immediate foreground territory Anyway, um, I'm sure some of you will be able to find something and prove me wrong on that. And, uh, you, you know, and, and, f and fair enough. Uh, but I have seen it and uh, it seems to work for me. So I, 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 that's what I do. Right. Anyway, um, changing brush. Uh, and I'm going to go to the to a large mop. Um, but use your if you're not if you haven't got a mop or you're not used to using a mop, uh, use a size 14 or 12 round. Um, so um yeah uh a 14 16 anything like that you know this i've, I've got a a larger um round brush kicking around somewhere um but they they do more or less the same thing i think mop brushes are a little trickier to use than large round brushes okay so can't really use my palette colors at the moment so whereas i have been using grayed down colors so far i think uh, the sky course was something a little cleaner doesn't it so let's clean this off for a moment doesn't have to be you know spotless i just want to be able to control the temperature of my mix i don't want anything in there that's making it look warm when it shouldn't look warm okay So uh, in the water uh, with the brush, I'll pick up um, some ultramarine blue. Actually, I'll mix it down here. Ultramarine blue, a um, little bit of cobalt blue for good measure. Um, and let's just start with that at the moment. Uh, now, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we, we 
you have seen me um, showing you how to use a pre-wetted uh, sky. So if you think back to what we were doing last week or the week before, um, I was showing you how to pre-wet, uh, which is just a case literally of, you know, picking up clean water and imagining there's paint in the brush and, and just pre-wetting down to a point where you want the paint to stop, where you want your sky to stop, okay? So pre-wet. Um, I mean, please do it. I, I used to do it um, more in the earlier days and I still do it now sometimes. So it's your call. Um, it's, what difference does it make? Um, if you don't pre-wet, you probably have slightly better control over the shapes. Um, whereas if you do pre-wet, uh, the paint um, is allowed to go wherever that water is, might not necessarily where it might not go where your brush is or where you've been with your brush. It goes where it wants to go. It travels through the water. So it's it, it can be it can make things easier sometimes, but also make things a little more difficult, depending on what sort of edges you want to leave. So I'm going to go wet on dry today, starting at the top. OK, very quick to reload the brush here. Don't, don't expect one brush load to, to achieve the entire sky area, to paint the entire sky area. I don't really need to go around my church, but for the moment I, I will. And I'm gonna come down to about here, okay? There we are, look, just about here. And I'm gonna just clean this brush off for a moment and pick up some warm uh, raw sienna. So just cleaning the brush off. But what I do next, I'll show you, is, is important. Um, I've got to get in quick because that's how quick it's drying off the edge. You don't want to, you must get in here very, very quickly. I mean, very quickly uh, with this raw sienna and go up and hit that edge because it was drying off. But don't push too far into the sky up there because you'll end up with a green lower half of the sky. Okay, but you've got to get into that edge almost immediately. Um, it's quite warm in this room that I'm in. A little bit of warm sky up here as well, I feel. Just a little bit, and I can cut into that edge. In a moment, you'll see me paint over the building, almost as though I, it's, all in, it's all part of the sky. But I am painting up to the edges of buildings just for now. Now, I just went into my water, and I cleaned the brush, and I squeezed nearly, nearly all the water out. So I've effectively got a very thirsty brush here. That allows me to sculpt the edge of that paint line like this. I can form those clouds just by lifting up like that. The brush goes on in, in the paler area. Don't land this brush in the paint and just pull up, make a, an upward movement and you'll get a very nice sort of low cloud, a distant cloud effect down there at the end of the road, at the, the back end of the sky. So land the brush here, lift up like that. It's just a just a little scoop, if you like, of the brush. Right, okay. Um, now I've got some drifting happening here. Uh, see how the raw sienna is drifting up into my blue sky. Now I've got to keep an eye on that because, um, and the reason why probably it's happening to my, in my painting is because I'm on a much flatter angle of my board okay for the for the camera setup um i prefer to work in a slight angle and you probably find that if you worked on more of an angle that drift probably wouldn't occur or wouldn't go quite as far up it would still occur but it won't go quite as far up now what i'm going to have to do to compensate for this is just make another cloud here and there just to take that drift out a little bit okay Effectively, these clouds, though, are closer to us, so you might have to make them slightly bigger, suggest that they're slightly bigger like this. There we are, that should be okay. Right, okie dokes. Um, so um, I've still got the blue, remember, on my palette. So I'm gonna go to the road next. I'm gonna bring, I'd like to bring some of this blue down across those um, buildings too. So just very gentle hit down there over those buildings. Leave a slither of white right at the end of the road. Ignore your figures if you've drawn them in like I have. Just paint through them for a moment because this is very weak blue paint. And about here, things are going to change. 
I'm just going to pick up a bit of raw sienna. My raw sienna's gone a little bit sticky. It's lazy. I can't pick it up. There we are. Um, and very quickly, again, because you don't want edges form in here, go across from one side of your painting to the other. This is that warm territory that I was telling you about, that is sort of mid ground, okay? And then, you know, you could sort of, we'll worry about what happens at the, um, at, at the building here. I'm just cleaning off there, but I'm making good with a damp brush. Um, so again, you have to do these things quickly. Um, you, you cannot hang about here. A little bit of cobalt blue, a little bit of burnt sienna, a small amount of burnt sienna, but that should be a, a slightly cooler color again. Bit more warmth. Bit more warmth. You don't want a massive jump from the warmth to the um, to the near the nearer area. But you should be able to see a, a fairly distinct, not too harsh, a fairly distinct warm territory here. I might need just to come down a little bit warmer. So again, once again, a little bit more raw sienna. Anyway, there we are. There's the um, there's the foreground. Now that'll all dry out. It looks quite bright at the moment, um, but that will um, go a little lighter, of course, as it dries out. Now, what I'm faced with here is something I really quite like. I almost this makes me feel like I don't want to put uh, any paint on this because it's really popping it out. But of course, that's going to look a little bit weird. Um, you know, that's still white paper, other than the painted in details of doors and win of, of windows and lines. So we've got to put um, we've got to put a paint on it. What so what it's really saying to me is, wow, that looks good. So keep it as close to white paper as you possibly can. That quite simply means, of course, a very pale, weak, watery wash of something warm, because that's what it is. And again, we're back on to the raw sienna. There we are. OK, so I start with a lot, but I won't start in here. I'll start here on the on the right hand side in the right hand buildings. So that's a strong color. That's a really strong uh, mix of paint. It's pure raw sienna at the moment. Nothing else in it. OK. But I'm just going to shape out. I'm notice I'm following the panels, if you like, of shapes. OK. This is still wet at ground level. So a little bit of um, drifting for off the wall into the pavement should be OK. But now, before I go in here, um, I'm going to, so I'm sort of treating this right hand building a little bit separate of that building now. But uh, for every area that you put warmth in, you must put some cool in. So let's pick up a little bit of cobalt blue. Okay, again, weak. What I, what I want us to, to, the way we need to be thinking about this is a, is a mid strength uh, wet in wet. Okay, here's the, um, got a little bit too much water in this brush. So I'm just squeezing some of it out in the paint, in, the, in my water tub, which is out of sight over there. Um, there's a little bit of cool creeping in, mostly at the top of the building. because You do tend to find your cooler colors more at the tops of buildings. And as you come down your building closer to ground level, things get a little warmer. So really, I'm, I'm really only concerning myself with putting this cool in in the upper areas of this vertical. It'll be a little bit down here, particularly as we move away from ourselves. Um, so that's okay. Now it should do its own thing. I shouldn't be fiddling in that now because 
there's no way that um, if I leave it, it'll do things that you'd never be able to do with a, with the brush by fiddling around with it in, with the brush. So that's it. Leave it. You know, have the discipline at this point to say, well, I've covered everything. I've left a couple of little um, uh, pockets of unpainted area. You know, around a little lintel, around a window. I've kept the paint away from. But for the rest of it. <clears throat> it's all partying it's all sort of joining up on the surface there so they're saying you know um it's mingling it's doing its own thing so and, and so let them get on <laughs> let it get on with it um don't don't interfere with it okay so um let's get on to this which um i'm going to pick up a um actually no i'm not going to pick up another brush i'm being lazy i'm, I'm going to stick with the same brush I'm just cleaning it out here in the water. Sometimes I will work with two brushes of the same size for those moments where I'm thinking, you haven't got the time to clean the brush. You know, you've got to catch this transition with a soft edge. So I, I would sometimes have a have a spare brush to hand, but uh, I have got time on this. So there we are. Um, this brush is now being cleaned. Um, there's water in it, but there's no paint in it. I'm picking up, remember I said, this has got to be really weak. So it's raw sienna with a lot of water. So I, I don't want to go taking the tonal value away from what it is already too much. Here we go. As I daub down like this in a vertical fashion, as you can see me doing, I'm pulling the brush down. Now, if your sky is still a little, little bit wetter, but you've got to be really careful um, because what I've just put on there could leach into the sky and mine might actually do that. In some respects, I hope it does because I can show you what to do about it. Um, so I'm pulling my brush strokes down like this because I can keep control over them. Now, if I make contact with this still wet paint of the right hand building, that's okay, you know, um, but look how weak Look how weak that paint application is. Go into the window a bit. Don't worry about ground level and figures for the moment. There we are. Now, so I'm at this point, I am literally going to stand back here and see if my tonal values are in the right areas for this stage of the painting. Because of course it will vary uh, during the course of the, 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 the stage, depending on what stage you're at. I'm just picking up on the fact that that roof is darker. So I'm picking up a little bit of cobalt blue, a little bit of raw sienna, that's a little bit of a, a lit and crimson. I, I just think there's a little bit of uh, purple in, in, in some of these roofs, these tiled roofs. So a little bit of, um, so, so, to, so, to, so to make sure you've got that little bit of purple in your roofs, and make sure there's a bit of alizarin crimson in the mix and any blue, cobalt, ultramarine, whatever. Um, and then a little bit of burnt sienna. And I've definitely gone too warm so more blue and too strong so be careful here because i've got to paint round this is my first this is the first place in this painting where i've had to think about not painting over things i think i might leave that actually rather than paint up to the edges because it's all still damp i think we'll put that roof in when things have dried off a bit be all right leaving it like it is it's okay um okay i think i'm gonna have to speed dry at this stage because it would take a good 10 15 minutes for that to dry okay now we're going to go back to the small brush put in a bit of detail and then we're going to look at the shadows that we obviously need to put in to create the light. So, so a small amount of detail over here, a bit more detail over here, put our figures in, go back to the original color mix, ultramarine blue or cobalt blue, doesn't matter. 
and uh, raw sienna. So just the faces of those buildings on the left there, the odd place, the odd, the odd uh, uh, underside of a lintel, um, the shadowed side of a, uh, of a, a feature, the odd slightly darker mark in one or two of those windows in the, in the um, fronts of these buildings down here. But don't go, you know, you've got to be really careful here not to, um, uh, not to overdo it. As I move down the street, you will see me add more water to this mix, which of course just um, takes the strength out, just weakens those. It looks dark, doesn't it? But that was, there's a lot more water in there and it'll be much lighter than these ones I just made up here a moment ago. So, dots, dashes, just an, a rough indication of things down, down at the end of the road there. Okay, but when, am I done over here? I mean, you could just, that would probably be slightly darker there because it's in the shadowed side of a, of a chimney, given that the light's coming from here. Um, you know, you can do all this, of course, with when you do the same time as you do the shadow, but um, now is quite a good time because you want to always do the smaller uh, shadow shapes uh, when you've got the big brush going. Okay, so again, over here now, I'm really going to start popping this out. This is a much stronger mix, more paint, really little water, very, very little water. So we can give the edge of that building because it's against the sky, quite a dark hit here. Inside here a little bit. Let's give the upper windows a little more darkness about them. And um, these lines here, these features, again across here. Up into that territory there. Um, there are subtle things going on, but you can't put them all in. You, you know, you can't copy them all, but you, you just choose what, what it is you want to indicate. My, my the flag there. ground level, I mean this way, a little bit darker. So let's start thinking about the figures. A little bit of darkness in that curb in one or two hits there, very hit and miss uh, application or uh, line that you're making. Okay, that pulls us that way. The rigger brush could be useful here because now you might want to use a, a straight edge, but or you can do freehand as I'm about to do here. Just put a line into your street, something like this. It's just not really there. I can't really. In some roads, you really can. You can see lines like this, um, but I put them in anyway, whether they're there or not. As long as you get it right. Remember, if, if you're not sure how to angle those, think about that um, horizontal line somewhere around the heads, isn't it? And just say, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to aim all my lines towards that point there, you know, up here, up there, from there to there, from there to there. They all converge on one little spot on, on that line back there, somewhere like that. Um, so rigger brush again, I'm just going to put in couple more details. There's a flag there. We could put some color in that in a moment. Uh, a little bit more in terms of uh, strength in places. Ultramarine blue, burnt sienna. Uh, a 
yeah, around here, I just feel as though we, we, we've got to make a bit more of this area. I'm not sure what's there, but I'm sort of copying what I think is, is in that photo. But now, you know, it's what I said earlier, I, I've really departed from the photo, if I'm honest, because I can't even see what's really there in the photo. This is me um, ad-libbing, uh, just saying, you know, this is what I want to see. This will bring balance. It's not necessarily what's really there. Uh, it's it just it's just a, me saying I, I want to bring some balance to to this area, some detail, some interest. Right, let's get into um, the figures. So let's have a head and a body with plenty of paint. Okay, remember the, where the head sits sits on the um right on the eye line doesn't it another head much further down the road and what i'm doing if you can see this really close is i usually leave a tiny little gap for the tops of the shoulders okay there's another figure here and i only paint the body's look and then i use the handle of the brush i've turned the hand the brush around and i'm just teasing down the legs Sometimes only one and a half legs of each figure. Again, body, if they get too so far away, I don't even put the head on, I just put the body in and uh, pull down the legs like this. And while we're about them, we'll just, with the same color, just put, give them all a little bit of their own shadow here. Okay. So even though the legs are not there, it's quite clever really, isn't it? Because the legs don't really meet, meet, the meet the ground, but the fact that the shadow comes from where their feet would be tells you that the legs are there. It's all inference. It's always just inference, not a uh, statement. So we've got a much closer figure here. Why don't we um, put a nice warm face in here and an open shirt? So you continue the color of that face down into the top of the chest, okay? And then we'll have a slightly more pure color. So a lot more blue in here. Put the shoulders in first, keep the shirt or jacket open, okay? Like this. We'll tease that paint down, trousers or skirt or whatever. Um, back to the red, take the legs across here like this. Again, there's no need to put the feet in. When things are in motion, when legs are moving, um, we don't see uh, the feet. Um, we certainly don't look at them. So why would we put them in our paintings? Uh, you can lift a little bit of paint out of the uh, face now. Just thirsty the brush to just squeeze all the paint out of it and water out of it. And I'll just lift a little bit of light for the face there. And on the left hand side of the head here, we'll just put a little dark mark as though, you know, um, it's a slightly shadowed, uh, it's a slightly shadowed side of, of the figure. And we'll leave it like that. Um, and I'm gonna speed dry this now. Now, if you want to put a fig, uh, sorry, put a car in, um, I'm just gonna show you the simplest way for now. There's many ways of doing this. But we'll suggest that the windscreen is, uh, we know it's glass, but we're going to suggest that this windscreen is uh, showing a dark interior. So there's a horizontal like that for the window, horizontal for the front of the car, and right underneath it, with the point of the brush, we'll just put a little shadow, okay? I, I, and at, at, at a later date, when we when we start doing other things, I want to show you how we put vehicles like this in our car. You can put a little bit of uh, color in, in the front there if you want. Suggest you know there's 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 light uh, hitting the car, but that's how really easy it is. You're you're just painting the darks of that shape, not not anything else. So the speed dry this, and we're going to put the shadows on. Oh yeah, and we do need, I'm just going to hint of a Union Jack flag here. It's only really the red you want to use for that. Um, 
you know, if you use the blue, you'll darken it. If you, if you use blue as I'm doing here, you will darken that. But so keep the blue separate to the red if you can. There we are. Yeah, I'm going to speed dry this and we're going to put um, the shadows in. Okay, as we did before, I'm just going to pick up most of this mix because it's the wrong color. There we are, that, that's sufficient cleaning for that. And uh, so when, even before I start mixing the color, I make sure that I've got tissue to hand because I always do this when I'm working with shadow. It's a nice big ball of tissue. For any bits I don't like when, when they go on. Okay. I'm going to use my flat brush for this. So water first. Because it's quite a always quite a large mix, I so I'll use both of these mixing well areas here. I'm just filling them filling them up with water. I've got one of these pipettes I, I managed to find. I used to use a lot. Oops, fall on my painting. Um, that'll add water very quickly to my my uh, mix if I need to. So a lot of blue. Ultramarine blue. Again, you could add some cobalt to it. I don't, I don't really see that that makes much difference on in this situation. So there's the blue, a lot of it, big, big puddle of it. Um, next, I'm going to add a bit of alizarin crimson. Whoops, I've just spotted here. Let me just show you. Uh, I picked up a lot of paint. And when you pick up a lot of paint, there's high likelihood very good chance that you've got um, concentrated paint pigment stuck in the fibers of your brush there. Okay, so I just squidge them out. You don't want to be suddenly finding a great huge um, uh, chunk of pigment, color paint in, in, those, uh, in those brush marks. So then we use a little bit of a little crimson. It'll, things will go purple. And then once we've got this sort of, once we've got the blue looking purple, it should, it should still be more of a blue than, than anything else. You should be able to see that blue moving towards a sort of purpley color, okay? Then we put in a small amount of burnt sienna, which just takes the sting out, the, the brightness out of, the, per, out of the, the shadow color, okay? Making it look a little more natural. Um, if you had to describe it, you could say, well, it's a sort of indigo. And you could probably argue the case that, you know, why don't you just use a tube of indigo? We could, um, but when using only one color for anything, um, there's a flatness to it. So if you did use indigo, I suggest that you mix somewhere else quite close, uh, a warm color, so that when your indigo mix goes on, you can pick up a bit of warm color and add it somewhere in places that you feel as though the shadow needs warming up. Because I'll, I'll do the same. I'll, I'll put this shadow on, and um, but I'll, you'll probably see me pick up a bit of warmth somewhere for the shadow. Now then, so um, we know that this is going to be the darkest area, the right-hand side over here, okay? And anything falling across the ground here is going to be as dark. Um, but over on the illuminated side of the road, we can't leave that really free of shadow. The, we, we sort of shadowed the end buildings a good couple of minutes ago, a good uh, 15 minutes or so ago. But um, I still think that it's worth imagining, you know, we've got, a sh we've got clouds. We, for all we know, there's another great lump of cloud up here somewhere behind these buildings. And that would be good because it would take out the flatness of this illuminated side. We could say, yep, there's a shadow up there throwing a really abstract shape over these, these buildings here, okay? So underneath there, there would probably be some more shadow. Uh, and that, that's, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. Shadow there, shadow up on there. Um, because it's at distance, and although normally hard surfaces like buildings have hard edges to them, this is a little way off from us. This is a bit distant, so we'll soften those edges slightly, okay? So there's the shadow from on the left-hand side. Probably be better if we show 
that's something like this. Now I'm going to give my attention to the right hand side here. And this will be mostly uh, in shadow, all of it. So and here's my opportunity to darken that roof. And darken up here a little bit. It's a little slither of light to the right hand side. Unlike the photo, that doesn't show that. Um, now, of course, that means some of this is going to have to go into shadow. Definitely going to be some shadow there, isn't there? So just about there. Shadow under that shape there. Something like that. So as I say, there's definitely going to be some shadow here. So why don't we sort of say light's coming over here. Uh, it'd be shadowed down there. And we'll give a nice abstract shape to this of light, I mean, to this to this shadow here. So this edge really is what's coming off the edge of this building on the right hand side. When I get to ground level, I always think that um, shadows soften. The light uh, creeps up the base of the wall often, and it's often warm there as well. So I'm just pick up a, I've got another brush here. Pick up another, uh, pick up some burnt sienna, and just push a little bit of warmth. Perhaps a little bit of cad red in there, but uh, anything a little bit warm in the base of that wall there. Okay. So the rest of this is shadow, with the exception of some reflective light at the near the ground again. Okay. Now we've got to come across the ground, and I'm going to warm, start warming this shadow up a bit. Oops. That was my little bit of uh, light red. Okay, which I'm only just using now because it'll offer a nice bit of warmth to this, this closer shadow. That's not blue enough though, it's too red. So let's, uh, let's connect the uh, figure to this shadow a bit. And then I'm going to, once again, with a nice warm shadow, suggest that there's nice horizontal balance to the base of this. And uh, we're going to suggest that there are um, there are uh, cast shadows off whatever's coming out of this the roof up here. Quite like the idea of something like that, a bit, a bit more of a uh, a bit more of an abstract shape from this from this building up here. Just makes it a bit more interesting. Now I can see that a little bit more strength is required in the nearer part of our left hand side. And that's more or less it. Um, you know, there's a very abstract edge over here of light. I'm quite happy with that. I think it just breaks up an otherwise dark area. And it would we'll just say it's reflected light. Now, finally, I'm going to pick up some. Payne's grey or neutral tint, burnt sienna. This is like glue. This is a sort of glue mix now. And right here in the hardest light, we'll put the hardest darks, very warm darks. So, so neutral tint and a lot of burnt sienna. There we are. Bit of rigor brush work. Cobalt blue. And uh, I can't see any, but I think it would be good if we had street lamp here and there. We'll put a little bit of the uh, inference of trees behind here. This is the rigor brush on its side, on its belly, just pushing up into the sky like this for the trees. Notice my trees are nowhere near as dark as they are in the photo. 
it would upset things if it, if they were. It would just it just wouldn't look right. Um, and I say I like verticals, even if they're not there. If it's something a, a post or something back there, uh, a line, a, a, another post, a, a signpost, whatever, things that will just break up the horizontal a little bit. And then I'm just going to spatter with a bit of white. And I'm sorry it's gone over by 15 or so minutes, folks. Hope you've all managed to stay with me. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to spatter a little bit of white. Just to bring a little bit of atmosphere in here. And if we need to highlight, put the odd little white highlight in, in any way, we shall do so. Let's put a little bit of white tops of the heads. Maybe on the right hand side of the car there, something in the shops over there in the in the wind in the in those areas. I think we'll we'll call it a day there. The, the figure is almost big enough to put features on it, um, but I'd be a bit careful with that. Um, if you do try something, uh, make a dark red and just put a line roughly where the eyes cross, where the eyes would be around halfway down the head, something like that, just to infer, you know, there's some features there. Uh, striped. Striped garment, why not? Well, now it looks like I've I've tried to make. Now I'm going to take that out. It just looks like I was trying to make the shadows uh, behind. So it's funny, you know, you do these things. But I always, do, I never hesitate with the ideas. Um, if they're wrong, you take them off straight away, as I, as I feel it was then. Um, just making sure that we've made enough of this territory here. I think we'll give him some slightly darker upper leg there. Something slightly darker at the edge of the shadows here, here, here. There we are, folks. Let's move all this out the way. 